Hello again. Today we're going to be talking about food law, so we're shifting gears a little bit. First, let's have some announcements. The first announcement is Quizam 10 is due today by 11.59 p.m. That's Wednesday, um, April 1st. Tagback questions and responses are due this Friday. Um, I believe that should be April 3rd. And then um, Quizam 11 is going to open on the 3rd and is due on the 8th. So um, those are our assignments that are due upcoming. Last time, of course, we talked a little bit about food labeling and packaging, what packaging was used for, and then the, the laws and different federal um, agencies that regulate the labeling of that packaging. Um, so what other laws regulate foods? It turns out that there's quite a few. So let's, as a place to start, let's start in ancient history. Let's just imagine that we are develop, a developed civilization. We have an established government. We have agriculture, so we're not hunting and gathering. We're growing crops in fields. We've got some domesticated animals for milk, eggs, things like that. What food, of all the different foods that we have, what food do you regulate first? What food would you regulate first? Well, in the case of Hammurabi, who was the ruler of the ancient civilization of Babylon, you would regulate beer. <laughs> and it turns out that this is very often the test subject of food laws, as well as, um, as different food processing methods. So Hammurabi instituted the first ever food law that we know about in history related to beer quality. So why in the world would you even bother regulating quality of beer or any other food for that matter? Really, it comes down to providing what the consumer believes they're buying. And so it's honesty um, in, in um, purchasing. Right? So Hammurabi, first oldest food law in 1750 BC, was all about beer purity, making sure that, um, that what was used to make beer uh, fit the definition of what beer was, in essence, like a standard of identity. Um, and they, they were pretty serious about it, too. The, um, the civilization, the, the punishment for breaking this beer purity law was to drown the punisher in the beer that they made, right? So that, that was the punishment. So things were pretty serious when it came to quality of their beer. Um, and, it was really pretty timely because beer had been around for a while, 12,000 BC, um, by the Egyptians. So thousands of years later, somebody finally got to say, huh, well, we really should start saying what beer is specifically and what makes a good, pure beer. Um, in 300 BC, we start seeing reports of artificial flavors you used. Now, you may be thinking 300 BC, they had artificial flavors. I, at this point, what they're talking about is adding in things that were not the flavor that was there, enhancing the flavor with something um, that was not part of the original food product. 200 BC, we start seeing descriptions of wine adulteration. And then Pliny the Elder in 50 BC starts describing bread adulteration. So you see all of these things have something in common. These early food laws are related to fraud, to adulteration, to not getting what you pay for. So if we remember back to our adulteration early definition, this is intentionally adding or leaving out a food ingredient. So that's adding sawdust to bread, for example, to um, extend the flour, or adding water to milk. We talked about that one earlier in the semester. Typically, we're putting in a cheap ingredient for a more expensive one. We're wanting to make more profit, or, or the, the, the person who is doing the adulteration is wanting to make more profit. In some cases, the ingredient or adulterant could be dangerous. Um, in 2008, there was a case of melamine being used in infant former, formula. Excuse me. So melamine is an um, industrially produced chemical that contains nitrogen. It is toxic to people. Um, and so in 2008, it was discovered that melamine was being used to bump up the concentration of ni nitrogen in infant formula while less protein, the other nitrogen-containing compound that we want to be there and that is regulated, um, 
that particular uh, ingredient, the protein, the milk protein or soy protein or whatever was in this um, formula was being um, diluted by using melamine, but the test still showed that they have, uh, the same amount of nitrogen was present. Um, and this resulted in a number of infant deaths in China. So even today, economics are still motivating factors for adulteration. And this is why we have laws in place. The original food laws dealt with that specifically. Another good example of this is papaya seeds being substituted for black peppercorns. This is black peppercorns are a spice and very expensive. Papaya is less expensive and seeds are usually not consumed. These little black seeds, once dried down, look very much like black peppercorns. So they were a part of that adulteration process. To continue on our timeline, um, that type of adulteration was described in 131 AD in written format. But then when we move through to 1202, we start seeing um, the first English laws for food uh, being written down and it prohibited adulteration of bread. So now we see food law progressing across the world, um, not just in uh, Roman or Greek uh, history or um, Egyptian history as well. So in 1444, a seller of adulterated saffron could be burned alive. Again, they take this stuff pretty seriously. Understandably, saffron is an extremely expensive um, spice. And so this is the, the stamen of a flower that is hand-picked. Um, it has a lot of potent color in it and a lot of flavor. And it is very expensive because um, it's difficult to produce. It produces low quantities. Um, and it is very... Uh, labor intensive to harvest. So at this point in 1444, saffron was highly valued because you can tell because of the punishment that was related to adulteration of it. We still deal with, with adulteration of saffron to this day without that same punishment, but it's still there. We start to see food law really become more related to society and cultural um, and social standings within society. In the 1500s in Elizabethan England, they had what they were called sumptuary laws, and these were enforced based on class distinctions. So if you were lower class, you could not have certain types of food. Um, they were reserved for the higher class dis, uh, portions of the population. So that deals more with, with social standing necessarily than um, with food quality or protection of that population from an adulterated ingredient that's dangerous. In the 1500s, the Ottoman Empire starts to impose food freshness laws, and that's present-day Turkey. Um, and then when we get up to 1516, we see the uh, beer purity law in Germany. And that basically said you should only have three ingredients in beer. Barley, hops, and yeast. And in fact, this law is still part of German law today. Um, and they are having some issues with, um, with really craft brewing. People are really starting to um, take beer outside of this beer purity law and create different types of products, craft brewers in particular. Um, and so they cannot call their particular product beer in Germany with that current beer purity law. So they are starting to evaluate, is this really harming the beer industry in Germany? A law from 1516. Things hold over a long time sometimes. In 1641, uh, we start seeing laws in the United States dealing with um, adulteration again of, of animal products, beef, pork, and fish, red quality, um, regulation of weights. So corn weights and prevention of wine adulteration in the Virginia colonies. Um, so all of these societies, as we progress forward in history, start to really see the benefits of having food laws in place to help regulate the quality of their foods. 1700s, we start seeing laws against adulteration of coffee and chocolate. Um, with beans and peas. This is in England. So at that point, they had started to import coffee and chocolate 
um, from the new world. And they were seeing a lot of adulteration because this was a very costly product and it was in high demand. In the 1800s, the increase in the amount of food production industrialization really started to have an impact on food. So the Industrial Revolution starts to come along. People start moving from rural areas with farms to urban areas like city cities where the food is not grown right outside your door. So you need to have that food um, moved from rural areas where those farms are to urban areas. And this is a whole new issue for people, um, a whole new issue for farmers and food manufacturers um, that are making different products. So really, we start to see this change in society due to the progression of technology and science with the Industrial Revolution, but it has greater impacts on the food production systems um, in, in the region as well. Um, Frederick Ackerman was an, an English man who said, the man who robs a fellow subject of a few shillings on the highway is sentenced to death, while he who distributes a slow poison to the whole community escapes punishment. And what Frederick Ackerman was trying to address was the fact that poisonous substances were being used in food products to extend their shelf life and their saleability. And so there was no law regulating this type of adulteration in many of the food products that were being adulterated. Um, so the, he considered this as high a, um, a crime as someone who was robbing someone on the highway, and yet there was no punishment for this food adulteration with, with poisonous substances. Um, so his treatise on adulteration of food and culinary poisons was published in 1820. So we're starting to see people in society really decry that these poisonous substances in foods we need to get a handle on this, that, that there need to be laws in place in order to ensure the safety of food for people. And this is the first time food safety is really the overriding goal rather than economic adulteration, okay? Economic fraud. So in 1879, the U.S. Food and Drug Law was proposed to Congress. And in 1883, Harvey Wiley begins work on food adulteration. Now, you may remember Harvey Wiley as the, the man who initiated the poison squad. So in 1879, the U.S. really starts paying attention to um, the fact that food can be dangerous and is made, being made dangerous by, um, by the manufacturers, sometimes by what they're adding to it. Um, and part of this was that we just didn't know what was dangerous in food. And that was a lot of what Harley Wiley, Harvey Wiley was after, was how much of a substance was considered poisonous. Because the dose makes the toxin, right? So, um, so we didn't know how much sodium benzoate we could add before it became um, deleterious to human health. You know, a little bit is good to prevent mold growth in acidic foods. But too much of it can harm human beings. So let's talk about few of the, a few of these very tasty ingredients that were being added. Green beans, when they're nice and fresh, have a bright green color. And of course, if you've been around green beans when they start to decay, that color starts to become a little bit brown. Um, the interesting thing about chlorophyll that colors these green beans is that it has a metal ion in the middle of its structure, and that metal ion will dictate its color. You pull that, that magnesium ion out, which is what's naturally present there, and it turns to an olive green of overcooked green beans. You add in copper, and it is a very bright blue color, blue-green color. Um, so if you have green beans that are going bad, why not add some copper sulfate to them to make them look brighter, and they look fresher for longer? The problem is, is that copper is a heavy metal and builds up in our bodies and is toxic, right? So not something you want to add to food in great quantities. Milk. When milk left the farm, it was just fine. But by the time it got to the doorstep of the consumer in a city, it might have a 
few days at best um, to be consumed, or it might have already turned where these pathogenic organisms could be growing or spoilage organisms could be growing and the milk was now starting to coagulate and get clumpy. So farmers found that you could add formaldehyde to milk and it wouldn't do that, right? It kills the bacteria that are present. Unfortunately, it does bad things to your body as well. So that was not a good solution to, um, to preserving milk and increasing the shelf life. Uh, something to note at this point that pasteurization was not in place yet. We didn't have pasteurized uh, pasteurization laws with regard to milk until the 1970s. So we, we have a long way to go before the food processing world catches up with the food distribution world um, as far as making food safe for us. Sulfuric acid was used to make a substitute for vinegar. So vinegar production is um, done with fermentation of a, a fruit or um, some type of grain. In this case, apple cider vinegar. Apple pulp is fermented with a specific type of acetobacteria that takes um, the sugars here and eventually produces um, an acid. Instead of waiting all that time, you could just use sulfuric acid to make something acidic. Except sulfuric acid does not react the same way in the body that a natural organic acid um, that is produced during fermentation does. And it has some pretty negative side effects on the stomach lining um, by increasing the pH so drastically. So, um, so this was also used as an adulterant and was not positive. Coal tar is another substance that you may not have heard of. Um, this is a, a byproduct um, a petroleum byproduct, essentially, and it is used, um, petroleum byproducts today are used to make colors and flavors. And in this case, they were using it, the coal tar, without a purification process or synthesis process to create a very specific compound in order to imitate vanilla and produce very bright, colorful candy that um, was really targeted towards children. So you can imagine that this had some negative repercussions as well. Without a, a specific synthesis and purification process, you have a lot of byproducts in this product um, that can cause some, some negative um, health outcomes. So if we took coal tar, which provides a specific amount of flavor and color, we used glucose as our sugar, and we put grass seed in to substitute for these little tiny seeds of strawberries. It could look very much like strawberry jam. However, not strawberry jam. And so this is one of the worst cases of adulteration. You don't have any of the original product in there, the original strawberries in this jam. It is all a mix up of different chemicals to give you the same appearance and some of the same flavors as strawberry jam. This is definitely considered adulteration and not good for your toast. So mislabeling is a whole nother category of food law and it relates to adulteration. So if we make up this product of grass seed, coal tar, and glucose and say it's strawberry jam, then we're, we have false claims, right? We the strawberry jam label indicates that there are strawberries in that product and there are not. So for example, if we label a jar containing these things 100% natural strawberry jam, this would not only be adulteration, definitely adulteration, but it would also be mislabeling. So these are two different um, groups of laws regulating products, mislabeling and adulteration. All right, so we left off at Harvey Wiley and um, the first food laws being do, introduced in the U.S. in the 1870s. And Harvey Wiley comes on board 1883 and really starts to, to push and drive and say, you know, we need to address the fact that food manufacturers are adding things to products that are harmful to our population. Um, it took from 1870, where those first laws were introduced, 1906 for a law to be passed. So the Food and Drugs Act was the first major law 
um, that was signed into being by President Teddy Roosevelt regulating food. Um, and it was the first uh, of several iterations of this, but it was the first major one. And this was really the first law that was the birth of what we have today in the United States. It forbid adulteration of foods from being manufactured and shipped across state lines or ex exported. The population, understand at this point too, was really uh, letting the politicians know that they were very concerned about this issue. Um, in 1906, Upton Sinclair published a book called The Jungle. Um, and you may have heard of this. It's oftentimes required reading in high school. But The Jungle was uh, a story about an immigrant family and them trying to make their way in an urban environment um, and working in a meat packing facility. Okay, so that was 1906. So this um, this book, although it was a fictional story based in on reality, um, again, really woke up the population to the fact that some pretty terrible things were happening in the production of their food. And so in 1938, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was passed. Now, this is more of what we think of as our food law today. This is more similar to our food law today. Um, and that was Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. So this included standards for common foods and limited uses of toxins and pesticides. So this was even more broad reaching. Um, we have cosmetics into this act as well. Um, and then it also included limitations on specific compounds. So Harvey Wiley really, really was a driver here. He became um, the first head of the Department of Agriculture, and um, he was quite the interesting character. So he actually was a chemist. He started out as a chemist in Purdue, and he had uh, an MD as well. He was a doctor, and he became the USDA's first head of chemistry. Um, he lived a very chaste lifestyle. He was very conservative religiously um, and didn't end up marrying until, nine, until he was 67. So very, very late in life did he commit um, to being married. And then he was also, his other big mark here was he was the founder of the Poison Squads where um, people were fed different compounds to in order to determine uh, what was toxic to them. So he's quoted, the opposition to pure food and drugs arose and fought back with the intensity and zeal worthy of a better cause. So he introduced the first bill in 1889. Um, the poison squad was developed in order to provide scientific foundation. At this point, we have very limited um, scientific measurements. So what we, in order to figure out toxicology studies, um, we're using the actual human being to determine what is toxic. We don't have animal models to utilize as we would today um, for, for toxicology. So this is very early days of science. We can't measure a whole lot of things scientifically. Um, not only is the industrial revolution taking place, but science is really driving it there too. Um, so the Poison Squad was focused on the harmful effects of things like boric acid, acid, borax, salicylic acid, sulfates, benzoates, formaldehyde, all of these things that we know today are toxic in the right doses. So Teddy Roosevelt was president at that time, who was a very progressive reformer, and he had pretty strong feelings about food and drug debate as well. Um, but he was, his feelings were really shaped by an incident after the seizure of Cuba in the Spanish-American War. So he was an officer at that time, and they were in Cuba, um, he and his um, men, and they were there being shipped food from the United States. And it turns out that they got a bad batch of, of food. It was, um, it was contaminated with pathogens. They all got very, very sick. Um, and so he survived this incident, but it shaded his feelings about food and food production and manufacturing um, from that point forward. Just like any president, Teddy Roosevelt had a pretty strong personality. Harvey Wiley did as well. And so it was not uncommon for them to butt heads against each other um, and have some, some pretty terse comments for each other. 
So te- Theodore Roosevelt's um, 1905 comment, I recommend that a law be enacted to regulate interstate commerce in misbranded and adulterated food, drinks, and drugs. Such a law would protect legitimate manufacturing commerce and would tend to secure the health and welfare of the consuming public. Traffic in foodstuffs, which have been debased or adulterated so as to injure health or deceive purchasers, should be forbidden. So they both, Harvey Wiley and Theodore Roosevelt, both had the same goals. They were just approaching it at a different angle. Um, And this was not limited to the United States. Across the world, and in Europe in particular, people are starting to really um, become aware of the misdeeds that are happening with their foods and how dangerous it can be. People who like laws and sausages should not inquire too closely into how they are made. Um, This is the first chancellor of Germany in 1871. So basically saying that sausages... You just don't really know what's in this ground up meat product. Um, So be careful. And that's very much how laws do as a philosophy with laws are as well. That you may not be really sure about what goes into making laws and all the behind the scenes. So this is the jungle, which had a big influence on creating these initial food laws like the 1938 Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Um, there are some included here some pictures of meat processing, meat packing houses in Chicago. Um, Upton Sinclair's book was very revealing about what happened in some of these meat packing houses. Um, so this is his comment about rendering. Their peculiar trouble was that they fell into the bats and then they were fished out. They were never, there was never enough of them left to be worth exhibiting. Sometimes they would be overlooked for days till all but the bones of them had gone out into the world as Durham's pure leaf lard. So this is a comment uh, or a quote from the jungle um, talking about the production of, of fat and the purification of fat and that sometimes some of the workers would fall into the vat and they wouldn't fish them out or remove them from that vat, or get rid of that vat of lard. Um, that, that lard went out to the public with those human remains in it. Um, and his, his famous quote about his book, his book was not intended to be about the food supply. It was more intended to be about the human rights and justices of all of the immigrant folks coming in and trying to have um, the American dream. But he, but Upton Sinclair said, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. What people took from the jungle was more of the horrific um, context of how their food is made sometimes, and particularly in meat packing houses. Um, his book was meant to draw attention to child labor and labor conditions for all workers. Um, this is an image from 1911. Uh, at a silver purification factory. So you can imagine if you're purifying metals, you're taking out a lot of toxic substances from from that silver. Um, And this is a child worker there. You can see he's barefoot um, and is covered in whatever toxic substances were being produced at that time at that silver facility. So not only did it draw attention to... um, to the food, but it it did draw attention to child labor and labor conditions. The meat packing industry uh, was predominantly male and it it did have some pretty negative negative practices that that weren't very safe. So were Harvey Wiley and Teddy Roosevelt adversaries or partners? Oftentimes, they were adversaries. They both were working towards the same goal, which is the ironic part um, as far as creating a law that helped with um, helped regulate our, the substances in our food and getting us fresh food. Um, but they, they definitely butted heads quite a bit. So moving on from our first food law in 1938, we start to see more and more and more um, amendments being added to this laws and acts as well. 
1958, Food Additives Amendment um, to that Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act was um, was passed, and this is this contained the Delaney Clause. So the FDA would not approve any ingredients for use in food that could be found to induce cancer in a man or after tests found to induce cancer in animals. So this is where we start to see um, toxicology pro progressing, and we're starting to use animal models, and those are starting to be recognized as possible indicators of toxicity in people. So this, this amendment, however, did not put the onus on the U.S. government. It put the onus of um, proving that new ingredients were safe on the manufacturers of those ingredients. So the government wasn't doing this testing. The um, manufacturer had to do the testing and prove that the, um, the safety of that new ingredient. In 1960, we get a color additive amendment. Um, and this is where, again, those manufacturers of all new colorants um, within the context are fitting within that context of the 1958 amendment. So we need to prove at this point that colorants are not um, causing illness in people. The Fair Packaging and Labeling Act really starts to produce the label that we are now very familiar with. Prior to this, the label was very clean cut and straightforward. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of information as to ingredients on that label. Definitely not a nutritional panel, right? Um, so in 1966, we start to see those things being regulated by law, where we had to have the ingredient on green ingredients listed there. We had to have a product name, how much product is in there, and who manufactured it. Those laws that we are familiar with um, are, that fall under the FDA's um, scope of of ability were passed in 1966 and have been updated um, between now and then, of course. In 1980, we see the Infant Formula Act being introduced. Um, and this, this was the first time we really see infant formula and its ingredients and concentrations of ingredients being regulated. Um, this was in reaction to an, a case where an infant formula manufacturer started to reduce sodium in its infant formula. Um, and again, in 1980 is when we start seeing some interest in reducing sodium in food products in response to uh, regulating high blood pressure. And so this trickled down to the Infant Formula Act. The problem is that infants, that sodium and chlorine, sodium chloride, um, both of those things are important to our bodies and their functions. The dose makes the toxin. So we need some level of it, and infants need some level of it. So the sodium was reduced so much that now you started to see infants that had chlorine deficiency, right, after this reformulation took place. And so in 1980, lawmakers decided that, no, we can't just have willy-nilly infant formula production. We need to have um, ingredients that go into this product more tightly regulated than we do for our regular food supply. In 1990, we see our Nutrition Labeling and Education Act. Um, and that this, it was at this point that all foods were required to have nutrition labels like we really think of today. Previously, the, um, the previous act was fit fair labeling, meaning that it had to have a name and the ingredients and how much was there and who produced it. This is where we start seeing nutritional information required on a particular product. Um, and we start seeing that legal definition of terms like we mentioned the other day, low fat, low sodium. What do those things mean? Low in reference to what? So those definitions started to become part of the law as we know it, regulating labeling. And in 1992, those panels started to be on food products. So you see it took two years for the law to be passed and then for nutrition facts labels really to be put into place on foods. So oftentimes it takes manufacturers a while to catch up from the law being passed 
to actually making sure the law is being um, upheld correctly. So this is not uncommon. It happened with our latest food law passing that we'll tell you about, about um, in just a few minutes. But the, these laws are rolled out oftentimes um, based on the size of different companies as well as, um, as the, the types of new products that are coming out. In 1994, we start seeing some laws regulating dietary supplement health. Um, so the, this is where we have to have labeling for dietary sup supplements like vitamins. And this law also established good manufacturing practices. So good manufacturing practices, if you don't know what those are, they are um, practices that are accepted uh, that make sure that you're abiding by good sanitation and trying to produce a good, safe, sanitary product. Um, so this is 1994 is where we start seeing those laws come into place. Good manufacturing practices are utilized in every food plant um, that, that makes products. In 1996, we don't see any more warnings about potential cancer-causing properties on saccharin-containing products, and pesticides are no longer covered under the Delaney Act. They were removed. So we can start to see some fluctuations. Um, the law is passed, more data becomes available, more lobbying is done by certain groups, um, and these laws start to change. They start to adjust for current information. So the, the potential um, for saccharin, and this is the artificial sweetener in little, pack, little pink packets typically found on the restaurant tables. Um, saccharin was initially cause, seen to cause cancer in um, mice when it was initially tested. Uh, but the dose they were using on these mouse, mice were, was huge. It was a massive dose. Um, so the the need to have that um, that law in place that said, oh, this could potentially cause cancer in animal models um, was seen that it, it wasn't really a reasonable model because the dose for these uh, mice was so, so high. I think it was something to the effect if you had to consume um, a 12 ounce can of soda, that if that was your dose, you would have to consume 300 of those in a day to get that level of saccharin um, to cause that cause bladder cancer in um, in the mice model, in the animal model. So that that um, that warning was removed. In 2000, we see supplement manufacturers begin to make structure function claims. Right? Is that really uh, what's needed? Oh, I'm going backwards here. Forward? Okay. So, 2003, food labels are required to show that trans fat is present. Okay, so that was back in 2003 that we started to see trans fat emerge, and we talked about trans fat with um, our lipid section, um, that, that trans fats react differently um, in our body and that they are not naturally present. They're, they come with hydrogenation, partial hydrogenation of fats. In 2004 is when we start seeing allergies um, be becoming part of our label. Um, that's when that big eight allergen list came out. Um, and we start to see warnings on foods that the product contains any one of these eight allergens. In 2009, we see the Country of Original Origin Labeling Act. So it's important, you see more and more information being driven to the customer, whether it's about allergies or allergens that could be present in this product, or it's about where that product is coming from. Now the COOL law or Country of Origin, Original Origin Labeling Law, um, requires labeling of the home country or countries for fresh fruits and vegetable products. It also required it for seafood products um, and animal products such as meats. Um, it gets a little dicey when we started, start getting into the specifics of it. For example, with some um, seafood products, if the product had been marinated, then it no longer needed to say where it was from. Um, so there were some nuances to this law that were pretty interesting. 
And then our most recent um, largest revision to food law is the Food Safety Modernization Act that was passed in 2011. And this is affectionately called FISMA. So um, if you hear anybody referring to FISMA, this is the latest, biggest revision of the 1938 law um, that was the original Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So let, let's think about the country of origin labeling uh, quickly on, and, and see what this contains. We see here in this, um, in this label that this product is farm-raised, it's previously frozen, and it's a product of Thailand. So previous to the, the cool labeling law, this product of Thailand would not need to have been there. It also covers this farm-raised portion. Um, so both of these things wouldn't have been on this label, and you wouldn't have known. So... This covers fruits and vegetables, like I mentioned before, meats, fish, shellfish. It, this also covers the method of production. Um, ginseng and nuts, some interesting random things thrown in there. And it's a requirement for grocery stores and big box stores. So not everyone, like the restaurants that you go to and small businesses, they don't need to have this particular um labeling act there. It is really for those grocery stores and big box stores. So I'm going to see if we can flip over this video. And I don't think it's working. <laughs> I don't think it's there anymore. I'll have to go back and see if it is. I will definitely link it in. Um, so with FISMA, we had a huge, or the Food Safety Modernization Act, we had a huge change, a huge shift in food laws and policy. It was a big environmental um, or um, in change within the government and with food processors. Um, we did have new food labels being put into place, and you can see here um, this wasn't necessarily part of the, the FISMA Act, but it is uh, the revision of the Food Labeling Act where um, manufacturers or the, the food label was really trying to show you what a serving size was and the calories per serving. And they wanted this to be reasonable. This came about um, because oftentimes you would have, a, say, a 20-ounce soda, and they the label would have servings per container, two and a half, and then all of these numbers related to the calories and the different macronutrient contents were based on one serving. But most of the time, people are going to consume that bottle as one serving. And so these numbers were not reflective of what was actually being done with that particular product. Um, so this serving size was changed. It was made larger. Um, along with the amount of calories that were there, very bold, very large. Um, we also start to see things like the total sugar content um, is now included on the label. So you can see added sugars, total sugars, and dietary fiber. Previously, we didn't know how much of this sugar was naturally present, like the sugar from fruits. Um, an apple has a certain amount of sugar, um, strawberries have a certain amount of sugar, but strawberry jam is going to have a lot of added sugar to it. Um, so we didn't know from the sugars number how much of that was added, how much was naturally present. Okay. Um, we also see that trans fat is being labeled here. Um, the more recent law, I believe it was 2018, has removed, ha has required the removal of trans fat from foods. Um, so we should not be seeing any of, of this on the label moving forward. So standard of identity. I wanted to cover this a little bit because it does start to become more important with products. We have a legal standard of identity given by the FDA, um, and this was set forth by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. We want to make sure that, of course, if we have strawberry jams, that it does have strawberries in it. And not every product on the, the grocery store shelf has a standard of identity, um, but there is an entire book 
a section of the Code of Federal Regulations that addresses standard of identities for food. And it usually has the common or usually na name for the food. It tells you about the ingredients that have to be there the ingredients that could be there, those optional ingredients. And then oftentimes it's addressing processing requirements. In the case of milk, this would be something like pasteurization. So this is the standard of identity for milk. Milk is a lactal secretion, practically free from colostrum. Colostrum is a product for, uh, uh, that is produced by the cow after it has a calf. So it's very enriched milk. Um, for the, the newborn calf. So that part is not included in milk production. If the cow has had a calf, it is removed from milk production for a prescribed amount of time. So no colostrum in milk. It is obtained by the complete milking of one or more healthy cows. Milk that is in final package form for beverage use shall have been pasteurized or ultra pasteurized. So we're starting to talk about the, the processing for this product and shall contain not less than eight and a quarter percent milk solids, not fat. This is carbohydrates and proteins. And not less than three and a quarter percent milk fat, as for whole milk. Um, milk may have been adjusted by separating part of the milk fat therefrom, or by adding thereto cream, concentrated milk, dry whole milk, skim milk, concentrated skim milk, or non-fat dry milk. Milk may be homogenized. So you see we've got all kinds of macronutrient requirements here in the standard of identity, as well as processing requirements um, that appeal to you or that address safety. And then it also says that it can be homogenized so that the cream does not separate out to the top, um, addressing that what can be done, as well as possible optional ingredients that can be added into the milk. All right, so. This is what we think of as milk in the container. Is this milk as well? So take a gander at that, look at that, and think about it. It says milk on the label. Is it the same as this product? Does it fit that standard of identity for milk? It also says non-dairy protein shake here on the bottom. What does that mean? And if you look even closer at the small print, it contains no milk, but includes milk protein. Okay, so gosh, is that confusing or what? Does it meet the standard of identity? It's called milk here. What about these products? Are these products milk? They all, um, a lot of them have milk on the label. Almond milk, soy milk, lots of things here um, on the label that could indicate milk. This is a big discussion right now. Should plant-based milks be called milk? Doesn't that go against the standard of identity set forth for milk? So in December 2015, um, there was a group that, that brought a lawsuit against um, Trader Joe's that, talking about this, this question. If we have something that's called soy milk, does that make people think that it is a dairy-based product? Um, so the judge ruled that the standardization of the milk simply means that a company cannot pass off a product as milk if it does not meet the regulatory definition of milk. Trader Joe's has not, excuse me, has not, by calling its product soy milk, attempted to pass off those products as a food that the FDA has standardized. That is milk. So they said, no, it's fine. Soy milk can be called soy milk. This is still under a great deal of discussion, especially as we start to see other industries um, start to have to deal with this thought process of it doesn't meet the standard of identity set forth. Think about the Beyond Burger. Um, it, it, this is not an animal product, uh, and they have some of the labeling can say meat on it. So is it meat or is it? an animal or a vegetable-based product. So this is part of the discussion that's still ongoing with standard of identity. It is not so cut and dry that it doesn't need to be readdressed um, in the forthcoming years. So this, con this discussion continues. Um, this was an update in 2018 here talking about what, um, that they had opened a comment period for, um, for names for dairy companies, right? So um, this is still a, a thing that we're trying to come up with amendment to 
and talk about what is um, what is going on with that particular product. So we're going to stop there. Friday's lecture is going to be about FSMA, the Food Safety Modernization Act. We've done a blow through of food history from the beginning of the first written law all the way through to the most recent overhaul of food law in the United States in 2011, the Food Safety Modernization Act. Mm -hmm. Food law was initially driven by trying to prevent adulteration of food and economic fraud. And very quickly in the 1800s and driven by urbanization and industrialization, start to, started to address um, the hazardous substances and the safety of food in our population. So we'll see how we're, we're looking at that in the forthcoming lecture on Friday. I hope you have a terrific day and I look forward to um, talking about food law on Friday.